When it comes down to longevity, when it comes down to performance, when it comes down to even mental clarity, protein is critical. And being able to simply increase protein within your diet isn't always as easy as it seems. Like on paper, you think, okay, I just add a couple ounces more meat or do this or that. But there's a lot of different ways to get there. And what we have to remember is that it's a very, very, very delicate balance between muscle protein synthesis and muscle protein breakdown. And if we are not finding equilibrium and being slightly in a surplus or right where we need to be, then all bets are off. Then you're in a situation where you're catabolizing and you're not just not building muscle, but you're actually breaking down. So the requirements for protein aren't all that much. Like generally speaking across the board, it comes down to about 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, which really isn't that much. But that is like a bare minimum standard, especially if you're active. If you fall below that, you're running into a problem. And since protein is like a hallmark for maintaining muscle, which is a hallmark for maintaining like youth, if you want to really put it that way, I think it's pretty important. So let's dive into some ways to increase protein simply. The first one is simple, add a hard boiled egg, okay? Now, I mean, you think, okay, sure, that's easy enough. I could have thought of that on my own. I didn't need a video, but people forget that you don't need much. Like one egg is going to give you seven or eight grams of protein on, depending on the size, right? But the other thing that we have to factor in is the complete amino acid profile. This plays such a critical role when it comes down to protein assimilation. If you're having lower quality proteins, you're not providing yourself with the essential amino acids that you need to actually do the job of synthesizing new tissue and repairing. That's why eggs make the top of the list there. But you have to remember that something needs to be cooked, right? So when it comes down to bioavailability, hard boiled eggs are usually like a 90% absorption rate. Now, just on a contrast, if you were to eat like a raw egg, it's like a 50% absorption rate. Whereas a lot of meats are even gonna be like between 70 and 80. So eggs have a very high absorption rate. But that one's pretty simple. This next one is really interesting. Spirulina. Okay, now you might be thinking, okay, this is some weird like vegan thing that only they're worried about. No. Okay, one tablespoon of spirulina is gonna have four to five grams of protein in it. Okay, if you look at a 100 gram serving of spirulina, it has 126% the amount that an equal weight of beef would have. What that means is that in a 100 gram serving, there's 57.5 grams of protein compared to a 100 gram serving of beef is only about 25 to 26 grams of protein. Does that mean that it's better than beef? No, I'm not saying that at all. But the interesting thing with spirulina is that spirulina is as complete of an amino acid profile as eggs. So you have a very complete protein in a very bioavailable form that is going to give you the most bang for the buck. But it's also going to be exceptionally nutrient dense. Huge vitamin A content, huge vitamin B content, ultimately a very powerful superfood if you ask me. But, you know, we're always trying to find ways to add protein in, so it's kind of a different mechanism. And again, bang for the buck, it really fits the bill. However, you really can't absorb more than like 15 to 20 grams of spirulina at a given time. So if you're looking to just add maybe 20, 30 grams of protein throughout the day, simply adding a tablespoon of spirulina to like each of your meals could be a quick way to get a 20% bump in your protein intake while also getting some good minerals and getting some vitamins in the process. The next one is one that people don't think about a lot either. In between meals, simply having some kind of good quality like venison stick or a turkey stick or even a good beef stick. I put a link down below for chomps sticks. These guys have been my go-to when it comes down to any kind of meat stick for I don't even know how long. They're like one of the original sponsors on my channel. They've been around for a long time. I'm good friends with the owner. He's a super cool dude. And the thing that I love, I love their venison sticks the most. That's because venison is such a good quality meat. And in my opinion, it just tastes really good too. But in my opinion, it's just one of the best meats that you can have. That doesn't mean that you have to go with the venison. Then they have the turkey sticks, which are significantly less calories. So if you're trying to keep the fat content a little bit lower, the turkey sticks are great. And then they're good old classic beef sticks. And they have some that are also flavored with sea salt. So you get that really good, well-rounded flavor. The cool thing is with chomps, like you could cut them up and you can add them to a salad. And the next thing you know, you've added anywhere from 10 to 20 grams of protein, depending on how many you add. You could put them on a pizza, you could put them in soup or you could just eat them straight up. So it's a simple way to add protein that is a very complete protein that is also just 
dang delicious. So I put a link down below for Chomps so you can check them out. You can get a special discount and get some shipped to your doorstep. I highly recommend that you try either the venison or even their new turkey pepperoni ones are super awesome. And they have no hidden nasties, no weird stuff in it. It's GMO project verified, really cool stuff, all grass fed as well. So check them out down below in the description. This next one is a simple one, good old fashioned Greek yogurt. Now, the interesting thing about Greek yogurt is it's a combination of whey and casein proteins. And you're not looking a ridiculous amount of protein, but you're looking like a 200 gram serving getting you maybe 20 grams of protein. What makes it unique though, isn't the fact that it has protein in it, it has a nice delicate blend of casein and whey. Whey protein, we know the obvious thing there, but casein is interesting because it can help the absorption of calcium if it's coming from a whole food form. Okay, so when you're taking in dairy that has obviously calcium in it, you want the absorption of the calcium to occur and you need good quality casein proteins coming from good quality dairy, predominantly A2 form dairy if you can. Okay, that's going to increase the absorption of the calcium. If you have too much calcium in the bloodstream, this can be a problem. But also, if you're absorbing your calcium, it reduces the impact on what's called the parathyroid. So if the parathyroid detects that you're low in calcium because you're not absorbing it, it's going to increase the release of calcium from the bones, which is A, not good for your bones, but B, can actually play a role in the accumulation of visceral fat. Which is a story for a different day, and I've done other videos on that topic. Point is, is a little bit of casein in a good whole food form is good. I don't recommend a casein protein directly, like a powder. Casein from a whole food dairy form is quite good in a small amount. Now we get into some really cool stuff, pistachio. Okay, pistachios catch a bad rap generally because they are higher carbohydrate compared to most nuts. So people think, oh, well, there's not a nut that I want. There's too many carbs in it. Well, first of all, it's predominantly fiber, so you don't really have to worry about that too much. But the cool thing about pistachios is they are one of the lowest calorie nuts. Okay, we're talking like 155-ish calories per one ounce serving compared to say almonds, cashews, which are closer to 175, 180. So that plays a big role. But additionally, we're talking about protein here. Okay, one of the highest protein, if not the highest protein nuts, we're talking like seven to eight grams of protein in a serving. So that's a good amount of protein coming from pistachios. But uh, you know, what's, what's a bunch of protein if you're coming in with a bunch of calories and fat, right? Well, pistachios are one of the lower fat nuts, hence the lower calorie content. But in addition to that, a lot of the fats get trapped inside the cell wall of a pistachio, which means they don't actively absorb in our bodies. Now, the numbers are all over the place, but just hypothetically speaking, if there was 10 grams of fat and you were to consume that, maybe you only absorb seven of it because three of it remains trapped within the cell walls and then you just excrete that out. So that is a phenomenal thing when it comes down to just the overall impact of the protein that you're taking in. But there was a really cool study published in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition taking a look at pistachios. They found that when subjects consumed two ounces of pistachios alongside a higher carb meal, this attenuated the glycemic response of that high carb meal by 20 to 30%. So that could be from the protein, it could be from the fats, but given the fat absorption issue with the pistachios, I'm more inclined to think it's coming from the protein, which is just a huge thing. So pistachios, as far as nuts are concerned, is probably one of the best bets that you can go. So next one, I'll keep it simple, chia seeds. Okay, again, a complete amino acid profile, really good breakdown there. Talking five to six grams of protein in a tablespoon, easy to add into the diet, plus keeps you satiated, and a better ratio of omega-3 to omega-6, so you're not risking that potential inflammatory effect of the omega-6s that is consistently talked about, whether true or not. And then lastly, this is a really cool one, one of my favorite seeds, pumpkin seeds. Pumpkin seeds are my favorite seed outside of the whole protein thing, just because they're super high in zinc, super high in magnesium, and they just pack a powerful punch as far as minerals go. But when it comes to protein, they're also a complete amino acid profile. Okay, they have a really good selection. They have all nine essential amino acids, which is exactly what we're looking for. The cool thing is the fat content, half of it is omega-3s. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, cool, I'm gonna get omega-3s like I'm getting from salmon. No, it's gonna be alpha linoleic acid, which does not have the same effect as like an animal-based uh, eicosapentaenoic acid or docosahexaenoic acid does, but you do get a powerful benefit given that that means that there are less omega-6s in this nut. Normally, omega-6s are what are causing kind of the issue if we overconsume nuts. So at least we're reducing and modulating that a little bit by just reducing the amount of fats that are omega-6s. 
There's also some pretty cool glucose lowering effects that come with pumpkin seeds, and it probably has to do with the magnesium content. There was a study published in the journal Diabetes Care, took a look at 127,000 participants, and it found that those that consumed the highest amount of magnesium compared to those that consumed the lowest amount of magnesium had significantly less risk, like a 30% less risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Now, mechanistically, what's going on here is it's allowing the cells to utilize or be responsive to insulin much better, okay? Now, there was another study that was published in the journal Diabetes Care that took a look at the mechanistic action here. When they gave subjects supplemental magnesium, they found that at first their magnesium levels actually decreased, indicating that possibly the magnesium was getting taken up into the cell. And then after that, it gradually increased in the plasma. The reason that this had a positive impact on insulin sensitivity is it affected the receptor for insulin on the cell. So in subjects that had lower levels of magnesium, they found that they had a reduced autophosphorylation in what's called the beta subunit of an insulin receptor, basically making it so the insulin receptor on a cell uh, wasn't working very well if they were deficient in magnesium. By restoring magnesium to healthy levels, that improved. So that means that there's a potential improvement with insulin sensitivity. And since pumpkin seeds are so high in magnesium, this is a very, very solid link there. But I couple that with the high protein content, Again, we're trying to look at things that give us the bang for the buck with the protein and also the glucose attenuation. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.